appointed as one of the first Royal Literary Fund Fellows at the British Library. Jennifer Potter first came to Virginia to research strange blooms, the curious lives and adventures of the John Tradescans. Her celebrated biography of the early 17th century plantsmen, collectors of curiosities, and gardeners to King Charles I. She has also written novels, works about gardens and landscapes, and two cultural histories of flowers. A longtime reviewer for the Times Literary Supplement, Jennifer has enjoyed writing fellowships at leading British <coughs> universities and at Hawthornden Castle in Scotland. She's currently a Royal Literary Fund consultant, fellow, and an archaeology ambassador for the Museum of London Archaeology. Her tenth book, and the one she'll speak to us about today, is The Jamestown Brides, the story of England's maids for Virginia. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jennifer Potter. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. And um, it's also terrific for me to come back to Virginia to, uh, to Richmond and Jamestown, where I did so much of the research for this book. And it feels like I'm bringing the Jamestown brides back home where they belong. <laughs> <laughs> What's new and different about the book, I hope, is that it focuses on ordinary women leading extraordinary lives. Um, curiosity drives all the books that I write. I want to know what happens to people and I want to be taken by surprise. And um, today I'll be focusing on some of the things that surprise me about their story. I'll look first at the Virginia Company's role in the whole affair, um, but why it wanted or even needed to send brides to the colony and how it um, recruited them and, and prepared them for their life in the new world. I'll also touch briefly on a very curious parallel story about um, Virginian Indian maids who accompanied Pocahontas when she visited <coughs> London in 1616. And it will then follow the women across the Atlantic um, to Jamestown and look at what happened to around a third of them whose um, lives I've been and fortunes I've been able to track. So let's start with the context to the Virginia Company's trade in lives. The facts are quite straightforward. In 1621, the Virginia Company recruited 56 young English women. Now, they were all reputedly young, handsome, and honestly educated. <laughs> <laughs> and it shipped them to Jamestown as brides for the planters. It actually claimed to have sent 57 but one of them turned out to be a girl of about seven or eight. Who was, <laughs> she was traveling out with her parents, so I've taken her out of the reckoning. <laughs> and for each woman um, who married, husbands were required to um, spend 150 pounds in weight of best leaf tobacco. So um, was this a trade? Now, of course, um, women had been coming to Virginia since the very early days, since 1608 and the second supply, they'd been coming as wives and servants, but there were never enough of them. Uh, there were never more than about, um, well, at best, one, in s one woman for every six men. When um, Sir Edwin Sands took over the Virginia Company, this is the uh, company's logo, and here is um, Sir Edwin Sands, he took over um, the company in 1619 from Sir Thomas Smythe. And um, Virginia wasn't doing terribly well at the time. The company wasn't doing very well. And what he wanted to do was to um, rapidly increase the population uh, by sending out more um, settlers and also by sending out um, women who would um, marry and produce children and would make the men more movable and less settled. <laughs> that, that, was, that was his plan. So um, in early 1620, about 90 young women duly arrived in the colony. They were sent out by Sands. And they were going to be offered free, or they were offered free as brides to uh, company tenants. 
And if you were a private tenant, you only had to pay for the cost of their transportation. Now, um, we don't have any lists that tell us who these women were. And perhaps it's possible that there never was a list because uh, the company at this time didn't need any extra money. But all that changed early in March 1621 when King James shut down the Virginia Lottery, which by this time was the company's main source of funds. Because, of course, um, Virginia then was run as, uh, as a private colony. King shuts down the lottery because there have been all sorts of complaints that uh, the lottery was sucking money out of um, local, um, local economies. And this left the Virginia Company virtually bankrupt overnight. And um, one of the headaches it faced was how to finance um, a certain Captain Norton um, who had, uh, the company had already arranged for Norton to go out or to come out to Virginia um, to re-establish the glassworks at Jamestown. But it found that it, without the lottery, it had <coughs> no money to pay him. So um, the response, uh, the company's response was to allow individual investors to treat directly with Captain Norton for his glassworks. And this idea developed into, um, well, four different trades. There was a trade in glass making, and that was particularly concerned to make glass beads for the Indian trade. There was a fur trading expedition. There was a trade in general supplies. And then there's a fourth trade which I'm interested in today. And it's a trade in maids to be made wives. I mean, which really is, when you think about it, quite extraordinary. And it, it's fascinating, or it was fascinating, to read the Virginia Company minutes uh, when they're discussing this trade and the, the, the kind of language they use and, and trying to put a, a respectable gloss on what was <laughs> <laughs> uh, a trade in human lives and human futures. And um, the roles for subscribers, because it wanted individual <coughs> investors to uh, buy into the scheme, even um, referred to, well, referred to the whole trade in biblical terms. And it refers to um, the comforts of marriage, without which God saw that man could not live contentedly, <coughs> no, not in paradise. <laughs> so uh, the Virginia Company was going to help create paradise over here in, in Virginia. And the economics of the transaction were clearly spelt out. <coughs> Minimum investment um, from individuals was eight pounds, quite a lot of money then, which was considered enough to clothe and transport one woman. In fact, it got its sums wrong, so it soon um, raised the figure to 12 pounds. Husbands were to be paid, uh, sorry, were to pay for their brides in best leaf tobacco. Originally set a price set at 120 pounds in weight, and soon raised to 150 pounds, which was then valued at 25, 25 pounds. Which, uh, if you do the math, it's um, that's more than 100 percent profit <laughs> on an outlay of 12 pounds. And investors would also benefit from 50 acres of land, which the company was insistent should not go to the husbands who were. Um, buying their brides, but it should go to investors and the land was going to be pooled into a new settlement called Maidstown. <laughs> and investors rushed forward, um, Sir Edwin Sands himself put in £40, Shakespeare's pa patron, uh, the Earl of Southampton, who was then the titular head of the Virginia Company, he put in £48. And um, the trade in brides eventually raised 800 pounds, so a lot of people were investing. I have to say uh, the trade was more, was more popular than the trade in glass beads, <laughs> um, but less popular than uh, furs, which raised 900 pounds, and much less popular than general supplies, uh, which raised a whopping um, 1,800 pounds. We know who the women were from these two extraordinary lists 
that survive in the um, papers at Magdalen College, Cambridge, in the archives of Nicholas Farrar, whose brother John, John Farrar, uh, was then deputy or, or sort of chief administrator of the company. And I salute the English scholar David Ransom, who first recognised the importance of the lists. Uh, lists like these are just, uh, it's gold dust for historians. Um, and interestingly, they read like a sales catalogue. Um, because for each woman, woman they tell us um, name, uh, has a father, father's profession. Uh, this is uh, the list at their fullest. They don't give these details for everyone. Uh, so father's occupation, domestic skills the women had to offer, and a named guarantor who could vouch for their honesty which was then a, a real mark. We obviously can't tell um, from the list if the women were handsome, but they were certainly honestly educated. And as many as um, one in six came from the ranks of the gentry. And those who weren't gentry all had male relatives who formed, um, it's like a microcosm of middling England. There were um, bakers, cloth workers, fustian dressers, grocers, husbandmen, saddlers, soldiers, victuallers, wire drawers, watermen, and, and the list go on. Um, three of the women were widows, and the rest had presumably married, uh, sorry, the rest had presumably never married, um, and their ages ranged from, the youngest was 15 or 16, she was a young waterman's daughter called Jane Dyer from London, and the oldest was um, gave her age as 28. But I do love it when my research catches people out because <laughs> I found her parish records. She was called Alice Burgess from, in fact, there were, there were two or three who were 28. But Alice um, came from Cambridgeshire and she was actually 31 <laughs> when she left and almost 32 by the time she arrived. They um, came from all over England. There was a good call from London and the surrounding counties. Um, there was at least one from Wales and some from much further afield. Um, at least, well, no, more than half of them were living in London by the time they left. And many of them were living in service um, with either relatives or with respectable um, people, respectable Londoners. And living in service was something that you did um, as a young girl between from your late teens into, um, well, until you married, because it was a way of gaining skills, gaining a small measure of independence. And you would also be able to put your very meagre earnings of a pound or two towards your all important dowry. It's clear from the, um, w the guarantors of the women that um, company personnel had trawled among their relatives and acquaintances to uh, get suitable brides. And one of them, um, Cicely Gray, was <coughs> even um, related to Sir Edwin Sands himself. And I wasn't able to find her birth record. She came from Gloucestershire, we're told. But I was able to trace the, the sort of complicated relationships between the Gloucestershire Brays and the um, Cumbrian branch of the Sands family. And um, the fellow you see here, I'm pretty sure, is her grandfather. He's called um, Captain Edmund Bray. Um, and uh, I found him in a church, in a beautiful church in the Cotswolds. He was shoved between the organ and the wall. <laughs> so it was actually quite difficult. Um, and his face has worn away. It, quite difficult to photograph him. But he has this splendid ruff uh, around his neck. And uh, that, I'm sure, is, is her grandfather. And other brides came recommended by the company secretary, the accountant, um, a lowly chap called Robert the Porter, um, individual investors, and London's great and good. Now, as to why the women should agree to travel, there's no simple answer. Personal circumstances will, of course, have um, been a reason for many of them. 
uh, a lot of the women had lost either one or both parents, which of course was common for the times. Um, and many had migrated to London in search of um, opportunity. <coughs> Economics undoubtedly played a part because it was just at a time, 1621 is the year they left, when people in England were feeling very poor. There was a combination of rising prices, um, declining wages, depression in the cloth industry, and very significant hikes in dowries for, w for women of all classes. And there's a comment from the um, social commentator John Chamberlain that um, England was never generally so poor since I was born as it is at the present, and that was just in 1621. Now, from the women's point of view, the Virginia Company was offering them, uh, <coughs> offering to find them a husband at a time when all women really had to marry. Um, society viewed masterless women with alarm, and um, preachers and the writers of ballads were particularly misogynistic. And this is from a broadside ballad of 1620, 20, so the year before the women left. It's called Fill Gut and Pinch Belly. And it condenses society's views of men and women into these two monstrous animals. And on the left, you see Phil Gut, whose um, only diet is good men. <laughs> and there are plenty of those. Uh, whereas poor Pinch Belly can only eat good women. <laughs> and uh, there are never enough of those. <laughs> the, the words of the ballad are even worse. Um, <laughs> But actually at this time, securing a mate was becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, and the London marriage market, remember a lot of them had migrated, a lot of the women had migrated to London. The London marriage market was especially difficult to crack. And um, most of the women would have liked to have married uh, apprentices. But to be an apprentice, you, you had to serve seven years when you weren't allowed to marry. And at the end of your apprenticeship, most um, young men aspired to marry the master's daughter or a rich widow, <laughs> who, and there are, there are ballads about, um, about this as well. Um, so though the women who had migrated to London would have had a particularly difficult time. But might some of the women simply have wanted to get away? Um, there's only one testimonial that actually survives for all the, all the 56 women, and it's for a, a widowed woman called Anne Richards. She came from, uh, it was written by the church wardens and parishioners of St. James of Clerkenwell. You see the church here. In fact, this is um, an 18th century church on the site. And they um, vouched that Anne Richards had lived among them for about six years. And they certified that she was a, a woman of an honest life and conversation. But what's really interesting is that the date of the testimonial is December 1620. So it's six months before the Virginia Company was actually looking for brides. And it says uh, that Anne had asked for the testimonial because she was minded and purposed to live elsewhere. So might some of the women have actually wanted to find a new life for themselves? You'll, you'll find um, the testimonial for Anne Richards among the Farrar papers, um, which also record the frantic preparations that went into getting the shipments of brides ready, because the company only um, finally decided to send the women in July 1621 and it, uh, the, the ship started leaving from the end of August. And um, so uh, there are lots of bills and uh, you can really realize, you can read how frantic the preparations were. And I especially love the list, handwritten list of clothes that each of the women was going to be provided um, for their new lives, because it kind of shows the life people had. They were to be given um, one petticoat, one waistcoat, two pairs of stockings. Oh, and this is an image from Henricus. So these are the kind of clothes um, that they would have been sent with. So two pairs of stockings, one pair of garters, two smocks, one apron, two pairs of shoes, one towel, 
two quaffs, that's you wear that on your head, and a cross cloth, worsted wool for darning, and yarn for knitting stockings. And there were also touches, a few touches of luxury. Um, there were a dozen white lamb gloves, which was a traditional bridal gift. And they were supplied by perfumer William Piddock at a total cost of four shillings for 12. <laughs> And for the Atlantic crossing, the company also provided sheets, canvas beds, bolsters, um, rugs, prunes for the body, and catechisms for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we follow the women on their journey across the Atlantic, um, I want to touch on the, um, the strange story of the two Indian women um, Mary and Elizabeth, they were Christianized, who'd accompanied Pocahontas when she came here. Well, she was by then um, Mistress Rebecca Rolfe, she'd married John Rolfe, and um, the Virginia Company had brought the couple and their young son Thomas over to London in the winter of 1616. Um, she, she was a great success at court, she was uh, well seated at the mask, she had her portrait engraved, and um, the family were living at, um, they started off at the Bell Savage Inn in Holborn and were then moved to Brentford. And by um, March 1617, she and the family were um, sailing back to, um, to England. They got down the Thames only as far as Gravesend where she was taken off the ship, she sickened and uh, was buried in the chancel of um, St. George's Church. At least two of her female attendants stayed on, and the Virginia Company hoped that it would um, train the women up um, so that they would become self-supporting, but instead they became a drain on the company's finances. So the company decided that what it would do would be to kit these two Indian women out, they were, as I say, Christianized as Mary and Elizabeth, and um, the company provided generous amount of clothes, far more generous than for the brides, ample stores and two servants apiece, and it shipped them off to Bermuda <laughs> to marry whoever would have them. <laughs> and um, the man in charge of their welfare was the accountant William Webb, who also vouched for one of the Jamestown brides. And they were shipped off to Bermuda just the month before, in June 1621, so the month before the Jamestown Brides, and the company spent three times as much on each of the two Indian women as it did on the English Brides. So let's go back to the 56 young English women um, who are, they set off, a, a small group of 13 set off by a ship called the Marmaduke, from um, East Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Um, the, it was a, a shipment that um, was arranged by a local merchant called Robert Newland, who was also um, an investor in um, Captain Christopher Lorne's plantation in what became, or has become, Isle of Wight County. So 13 brides leave from um, the Isle of Wight, 36 sail uh, by the Warwick, which leaves from Gravesend. But first of all, they have to catch the, the long ferry from Billingsgate down the Thames to Gravesend. <coughs> and the much smaller Tiger left from here as well, with just three brides. And uh, the Marmaduke and the Warwick took at least, it's strange, it took at least three to three and a half months to cross the Atlantic, which seems a long time um, even by the standards of the day. And I would ask you to, um, that, that's Gravesend, I would ask you to imagine the conditions that the women must have endured, crammed into this space, it's called between decks, and they would sleep two to a, a wainscot box. Um, and they were crammed in there with stores, with perishable cargo, with guns, um, and they were cooped up here for most of the voyage. The few who sailed, the few women who sailed by the Tiger, had um, a particularly terrifying encounter with pirates and <coughs> off the coast of Spain. Um, and we only hear of their safe delivery from um, a sermon of, um, of thanksgiving 
that was preached before members of the Honourable Company, a Virginia Company, at Bow Church in Cheapside. Uh, the date's significant. It's a ser sermon of thanksgiving for all the wonderful um, things that are happening in Virginia and the safe delivery of the Tiger women is, is one of those things. And the date is 18th of April, um, 1622, which was four <coughs> weeks after a terrible catastrophe had hit Virginia, and we'll come on to that later for those who aren't um, quite sure of, of the dates. But all the brides reached um, Jamestown safely. Were they shocked by what they found? Uh, I wonder. Uh, and throughout the book, I tried to put myself, and I hope um, you, the reader, into the women's <coughs> shoes, because they'd left um, a city of more than 200,000 souls that was fast becoming one of the great capitals of Europe. They'd trekked across the Atlantic, they'd um, reached the James River, they'd spent another two days going up the James River, and uh, this is what they came to. Uh, this is Jamestown today, and I imagine it's a lot tidier than it was then. <laughs> and um, this is one of the early engravings of Jamestown. Remember, from a city of 200,000 people, they come to a place with uh, a sort of triangular fort, guns, a wooden church, a few granary buildings, um, and barely two dozen houses clustered within and around the fort area. We don't know how the women chose their husbands. They um, were promised a free choice of, of, of the man they would marry uh, because the company said the, um, the liberty of marriage we dare not infringe. Um, and it asked the governor and the council to um, be like fathers to the women in the choice of husband. But at the same time, it didn't want poorer planters to get anywhere near them um, <laughs> because uh, they wouldn't have the required 150 pounds of tobacco. And certainly poorer planters would complain about being kept away from the women. Um, so uh, there was a, um, um, the Vice Admiral of Virginia called John Pountis was instructed to collect money from the husbands and uh, who arrived of women who arrived by the Marmaduke, and uh, a certain Edward Blaney was to collect money from uh, women who arrived by the Warwick. So, so what happened to them? As anyone researching Virginia's early history knows, we are blighted by the loss of early records. And it's particularly difficult when you're trying to trace women who changed their sur uh, surnames on marriage and especially women with common Christian names. And more than half the 56 women were called either Anne, Elizabeth, Alice, or Mary. <laughs> and Anne and Elizabeth were especially pop popular. Um, but I have been able to track um, what happened to around a third of the brides. Uh, with its usual optimism, the Virginia Company said that divers were married, divers just means between a few and, well, it could mean a very few, or it could mean um, many. Uh, divers were married before the ships left for England. And um, those who didn't find a husband straight away were dispersed around the James River to settlements. And they had to be, to, they had to be chaperoned, so they had to stay with married um, settlers until they could find a husband for themselves. One of the surprises in my research was actually how few eligible men there were. And there'd, there'd been a census in 1620 that counted only 222 habitable houses. And of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of those would have been inhabited by uh, men who were already married. I think the many gentry women would have found it especially hard to find a husband because elite settlers had other ways of finding themselves a wife. And the women weren't cheap. Uh, 150 pounds of tobacco would buy you two houses and six acres of land at this time in um, Charles Humble. Uh, 
And the, the cost per bride was also, oh, more than twice buying an indentured servant. Um, and you, could, uh, you would also be able to claim 50 acres of land for any servant you imported. But what happened to them? Well, for some of the women, the end came brutally soon. <laughs> in the great Indian attack of March, 22nd of March, 1622. So this was, remember, the, th the sermon of Thanksgiving was four weeks after this event. Um, it was orchestrated by Powhatan's brother, Oprah Chankanao, in an effort to drive the English out of Virginia. Um, Jamestown itself was spared, but a number of settlements to which the women traveled were especially badly hit. And uh, among those who died at Powell Brook was Cicely Bray, um, Sir Edwin Sands' relatives. Remember, we saw her grandfather with the splendid ruff. Some survived the slaughter, even if they failed to find a husband. And um, according to a census conducted in 1624, London Taylor's daughter, Elizabeth Starkey, uh, was living in the Jamestown household of Edward Blaney. He was the agent. She appears, she's second on the list, Elizabeth Starkey, right at the bottom of the list of his household members. One above the very final name was Eleanor, um, who wasn't even given the respect of a surname and may have been, and this is only conjecture, um, one of the Africans who came to Virginia from 1619. And, they sh um, and Elizabeth Starkey should not have been there as a servant. And in the house next door, this is the site at the moment, in the house next door at the, house of, at the home of Dr. Pott, um, there was another, um, another of the brides called Fortune Taylor. Well, she wasn't a bride. She hadn't found a husband. And again, she was a servant. And um, Dr. Pott is... Um, for me, he's one of the uh, villains of the story. He's, um, he's supposed to have been a, a, good uh, a good physician, but a bad master. More positively, I trace uh, the fortunes of three of the women who married, who found husbands and married, had children and settled down. Um, one of these, the first of these is, um, she's called Catherine Finch. She was born in the rural parish of uh, Marden in Herefordshire. You see the church where she was baptized. It's right on the borders between Wales and England. By the time she left for Virginia, she was living in service with her brother. Her brother was <coughs> called Erasmus Finch, crossbow maker to King James. And they were living on the Strand in Westminster. Uh, I found him, and there was another brother who lived Temple Bar and another crossbow maker up St. Martin's Lane. And um, I found him in um, Erasmus Finch in court records. He, he seems to be a, a rather argumentative fellow. And he, he keeps getting involved in neighborhood disputes um, with, with a strange bunch of, of both artisans and gentlemen. And I also found him in tax records. And living close to the Finches on the Strand uh, was a man called George Thorpe, who may have provided the link between um, Catherine and her future husband. Um, because by the time Catherine left for Virginia, George Thorpe was the governor of a settlement over here, the settlement of Berkeley 100. And he was um, a, a deeply religious man and one of the very few settlers to advocate decent treatment of the native population. And he even had a house built, this is before the Indian attack, of course, um, a house built for Oprah Chankanao. Um, it was a house that um, the Indian chief was supposed to be so delighted with, especially its lock and key that he used to um, go in and out of his house a hundred times a day. <laughs> and the man thought commissioned to build the house was a carpenter, was Catherine's future husband, Robert Fisher, um, who had arrived here, he was, he's called a, an ancient planter because he arrived here 
um, early in 1911. And he submits a bill for, um, for building the house. But despite his sympathies for the Indian population, Thorpe was, was murdered, was killed in the Indian attack. But Robert and Catherine survive. And um, they go to live, they settle, uh, that's over Chankana, they settle in Jordan, it was then called Jordan's Journey, it's now Jordan's Point, which was a very small settlement of just around 15 households. Um, they have a daughter called Cicely, uh, born in late 1623 or early 24, and they ranked around number four in the pecking order. Um, but after the census of 1625, I'm afraid the, the family just disappear from the records. Um, the closest I came to experiencing what life might have been like for Catherine was when I went next door to the Department of um, Historic uh, Resources here in Richmond and looked at objects that women might have worn. And these are objects excavated from Jordan's journey and they date from around the time. And there's this lovely earring dangle um, and also a silver bodkin which would have been worn by Cicely Jordan, the, um, the um, commander or the, um, the wife of the settlement, of the, the, the leading man in the settlement. And a bodkin was both, you, you wore it as a, an ornamental hair in, in your hair, as a hair or ornament, uh, but also it was an embroidery tool. Um, another of the women, and we have one of uh, her direct descendants here in the audience today, uh, was Audrey Hall, who was baptised, she came from Aylesbury, um, in Buckinghamshire, close to London. She was the daughter of a, a cordwainer or um, a shoemaker. And um, when she came over, she married another ancient planter called uh, Thomas Harris. And they lived, it was then called Neck of Land, Charles City, but they lived at Bermuda 100. And um, her husband, Thomas Harris, went on to become uh, he probably arrived as a labourer or, or a workman, but he certainly became one of Virginia's elite. And they had two children. There was, um, first of all, a daughter called Mary, and then a son called William. Um, and um, Thomas Harris becomes, becomes a captain and becomes uh, really quite substantial. Another of the uh, women who who found the same sort of husband who uh, could thrive in Virginia's thrusting society was a young woman called Bridget Croft. She uh, was born in Salisbury, or close to Salisbury, <coughs> in a little village surrounded by water meadows called Britford. It's within sight of Salisbury Cathedral, which you can just see there. Um, and she married, she married a man who came over much later, he came in 1618, sorry, later than Thomas Harris, and um, they too survive the Indian attack, and um, they go over and settle on the eastern shore. Um, this is from a detail from John Smith's famous map of 1612, so the eastern shore is there, so they settle around there. Um, Again, um, they, well, they go to a place um, where Bridget has her home, it's called King's Creek, and it's right next to the Secretary's land, so it's clearly one of the, they were one of the first uh, early settlers over on the eastern shore. They started out with very little, they had um, a house, a gun, and seven barrels of corn, we learn in 1625, but nothing else. Um, their daughter, another Mary, was born soon after. And um, like Thomas Harris, John Wilkins built up substantial land holdings, um, which are still marked to get today. I think it's absolutely fascinating going round um, communities where these women lived and finding reminders. This is Wilkins Drive marks the uh, northern boundary of the first of his many 
land patterns. And this is 400 years later, and I wonder how many of us will uh, <laughs> still be, still have left our mark 400 years from now. It was interesting, he, like um, Thomas Harris, he becomes, uh, he becomes a Burgess for a short time, and he also uh, becomes a commissioner for the court, but he never learnt to read or write, which is um, extraordinary. Were the women happy in the lives that they'd chosen for themselves and the husbands they'd found? Uh, of course we can't know. Um, if you can't, you know, we, we, we can't know their private thoughts, but um, marital gossip that emerges in court records um, <laughs> suggests that um, both marriages had problems. Um, and according to local gossip, Audrey husband's, uh, sorry, Audrey's husband, Thomas Harris, was a notorious womanizer. <laughs> and in a court case of March, 1626, a neighbour repeated the claim that there were 14 women in church and seven of them were Thomas Harris's whores, <laughs> um, which suggests he had sexual relations with half the women in the settlement where he lived. In the Wilkins case, it was Bridget, who, uh, it was her supposed philandering. Now this is only gossip and <coughs> um, one doesn't know um, whether it's trustworthy, but her supposed um, philandering um, surfaces in court records. In a case of slander, she's actually not part of the case. It's, it's um, slander between, there are two married couples and there's a slanging match between both of them. And Bridget gets caught in the crossfire when um, the husband of one of the defendants accuses the other woman of spreading rumours that he'd committed adultery with Bridget, the wife of Mr. John Wilkins, and that in return for sex, Bridget had offered him enough cloth to make a shirt. <laughs> um, and a final, uh, another curious parallel between the two women's stories is that after, both women died around, sometime in the early 1630s, and the men married again, both husbands made fraudulent land claims on, um, and that um, John Wilkins claimed 50 acres, which should have gone to the investors in the Virginia Company. Thomas Harris actually claimed that Audrey, his wife, had been an ancient planter, which means that um, she'd arrived in the colony before 1616, which she clearly hadn't, and he claimed 100 acres. <laughs> so, um, but both of the women will have lived long enough to find out what happened to um, uh, the final bride whose story I'll tell, um, Anne Jackson, <coughs> born in um, Salisbury. By the time she left um, for Virginia, she was living in London in a place called um, Tothill Street. She went to uh, Martin's Hundred um, to join her brother who was um, living there, so, and she came in the Marmaduke. And Martin's Hundred was one of the settlements that was really badly hit in the um, attack of March 1622. And at least 70 settlers were, were killed and it was thought that Anne Jackson was killed. But in fact, she was taken prisoner by the Indians, taken captive. Um, and um, I mean, of all the Jamestown brides, her story is, uh, is the one that I feel um, most, most sympathy for. Um, it used to be thought that she was released after a year or two, but I think she stayed with the Indians right until she reappears in court records in January 1629. Mm -hmm. And um, she will have um, been worked hard as a captive. It's possible, but this is pure conjecture, that um, I mean, she, she certainly will have, will have to adapt to, to native ways. But I think it's possible she could have formed an attachment with one of her captors. Women um, taken prisoner weren't, were generally not raped, um, but she may, have, um, uh, she may have formed an attachment and may have had a child. As I say, I can't, I can't be certain. But she will definitely have had to um, completely change her way of life 
and get rid of her English modesty because as her clothes wore out, she would have had no choice but to dress in Indian fashion. But then um, she reappears in court records where um, it's, uh, it's said that um, after good consideration, Anne Jackson, which came from the Indians, should be sent to England for, with the first opportunity of shipping and that her brother John Jackson shall give security proper passage and keep her safe till she be shipped abroad. You know, had she lost her reason? Um, had, she, had she gone native and had to be bundled um, out of the colony in disgrace? Or had she simply succumbed to the trauma of returning to the, the sort of loud, volatile, hierarchical English society at, at Martin's 100? Um, I'll end very quickly um, by asking whether the Virginia Company's scheme counts as success or failure. I mean, certainly um, the scheme to bring brides to Virginia was never repeated and uh, within a year or two um, the Virginia Company slid into complete bankruptcy and Virginia became a, a royal colony. I doubt if any of the investors got their money back. Maidstown was certainly never built. Uh, I remain disturbed and, and kind of shocked that while the company continued to demand payment for the brides after the Indian attack of 1622, it never stopped to ask um, if the merchandise was still alive. <laughs> um, but let's, let's end with the lucky ones who found a husband, produced children, put down roots here in the new world, their lives were undoubtedly hard, but they would have been hard in England too. Um, and they took their chances and survived. And as I said, we have one descendant of Audrey Hall here today. And I met another of her direct descendants, and we had tea at the British Library, which, which sounds kind of right. Um, <laughs> but Audrey Hall and Bridget Croft and the others who survived it's ordinary women like these who I think deserve the title of the founding mothers of America. Thank you. shipload of brides came in 1619. Um, 1620, in fact. They were organized in 1619. 1619, 1619 yeah. And of course, they were women at Jamestown earlier than that. Of course. But if this was the last time the, Jane, the Virginia Company sent uh, a load of women, how many years would they have, how many times would they have done that? Um, I, I have a, a personal reason to ask because I am a direct descendant of Mordecai Cook, who I don't know if you know the story of Mordecai Cook, who was one of the planters and lived in the Gloucester area. And he sent word, this has come down through all the things and it's in the, all the records, he sent word he would not be there to help. Uh, he wanted first choice, he was fox hunting and he wanted his fox. He would pay <laughs> double the uh, two, uh, of the amount of hogsheads of tobacco in order to get a redhead. And he got a redhead. <laughs> and every descendant that I've ever met that is descended from him, redhead is ruining in their family. Uh, okay. But I'm just curious, how many years of brides did they send? I think, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful story. The Virginia Company, of course, uh, went bankrupt very soon after, and Virginia became a royal colony. This was the last official shipment. <coughs> and as far as I know, there were only the two shipments. There was the 90 brides, and then there were the, well, it claimed 57, but it really was 56. I mean, it had been sending over women of ill repute, and it had been sending over vagrant children, both boys and girls. But I think this was the only organized 
um, shipment for which it uh, charged a fee that um, brought profit to investors. But <coughs> lovely stories. Thank you. What happened to the Indian women who went to um, Bermuda? Um, all we know, uh, and we know of the story from um, Captain John Smith's writing, and we only know um, that one of them was married. Now, I don't know, there were the two women who went. I, I think it's a fascinating story. One of the women uh, was well married, and um, the marriage was surrounded with something like all the victuals you could imagine or something. So it was clearly... Um, you know, she married, um, whether the other one died, because um, it, it's not clear whether there were two or three. One of the Indian women were, um, was actually quite sick. Now, she may have died, so it may have been three, and the two health, uh, ones who remained healthy went over, but um, that's, the last, that's the last I've found out. Maybe it's um, someone else can pick up the research. Thank you. Questions, oh, there is a question over there. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you mean the tenacity exhibition? Yeah. Yes, I um, contributed to um, some of the women's stories are in the exhibition, um, and I contributed research stories, and I went there a few days ago, and it was actually wonderful to see the research being used in interactive displays, and I write books, but there was a display of, I call them my women, which I really shouldn't, <laughs> um, but th there was a young boy faced with, and you could follow what happened to about eight of the women, and he was pressing buttons and everything was whizzing around. Um, no, it's, it's a really interesting exhibition, and the uh, Modern College Cambridge had lent some, uh, the original lists um, and when I visited they, they can only stay open a certain amount of time um, because of light and so on so they've been um, the organizers have been changing the pages but when I visited um, the page was open at Anne Jackson um, which I felt really um, I, I feel quite attached to her and uh, in fact, this time did also um, visit the Pamunkey Reservation up on the Pamunkey River where um, I'm pretty sure she was taken and lived there. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful visit. Someone. I was interested to hear your characterization of Dr. My Jamestown ancestor came in 1620 as an indentured servant to him. And I wonder, and he made good. He married ancient planner Mary Bailey, so he did okay for himself. But I'm wondering why you said Dr. Pop was such a bad Okay, man. okay, yeah. No, um, um, thank you. I, 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 I hope I'm not treading on toes. Remember? Um, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not your ancestor. Um, one of the, wo uh, the, the women who were taken captive from Martin's Hundred included a woman called Jane Dickinson. And uh, her husband was killed in the attack and she was um, taken by the Indians and she was actually ransomed by Dr. Pollitt uh, for glass beads. Uh, but this wasn't an act of charity. He insisted that she should work off her debt to him and that she should also work off the um, years owing, owed rather, by her dead husband. And um, she, uh, after a year or so, she petitions the governor of um, Virginia and asks to be released from her debt to Dr. John Pott because she says her servitude with him, with Dr. Pott, is little different from my slavery with the Indians. Uh, and Dr. Pott has a um, plaque up in Jamestown Church, and I would like um, some of the, the uh, ordinary women to have their plaque up there, as well as
was the Dr. Potts of this world. <laughs> With the conversation about the exhibit at Jamestown, I hope everyone's aware that this year is a celebration of Jamestown 2019, celebrating the representative government, the slaves, first arrival slaves, and the women. Um, there's a lot coming up on the women. I'm currently on the committee of the women for this celebration. Uh, there's a new statue down at the Capitol Square that recognizes the women of Virginia starting then till now. And there will be a large symposium in October on the women and, uh, and up until this date. And I saw a lot of information in your bookstore about this year's celebration of 2019. And the women's part of it is coming up. So if you're really interested in all of this, you all look for those events and go to them. One last question. Does your research show that any of the women went back to England? Um, well, I mean, Anne Jackson was supposed to be sent back to England. That's what the court case says, that, um, that her brother should, once she's come back from the Indians, um, he should keep her safe till she can be shipped aboard uh, to go back to England. And I actually looked for her in uh, Westminster in burial records for Westminster, and several Anne Jacksons were buried in Westminster in the various parishes in the 1630s, but it was a common name, and um, I can't be sure that she ever did make it back. I, I suspect, I mean, yes, people were traveling back to Virginia, but these women arrived with nothing. I think it's very unlikely that any of them ever got back to England. I mean, the, the, the um, Catherine Finch who married um, Robert Fisher, it's possible that family um, returned to England, but I think it's much more likely that they succumbed to dysentery or um, illness or saltwater poisoning or, or whatever, or, or all the, the sort of diseases here. So um, I can't answer absolutely, but I think um, Anne Jackson may have done, but not the others. Thank you. Thank you very much.